Welcome to the B2B Digital Marketer Podcast, a podcast helping you to end your struggle with digital marketing, helping you to pave a new and better path to target and capture your ideal customer. Each week, we teach you how insiders and experts debunk the dreary and become engines of innovation. Now, here's your host, Jim Rembach. Okay, B2B DM gang, I am excited today because we're going to get in some really good discussions from somebody who has multiple perspectives on how to actually generate significantly more leads and really brand awareness. Steve Goldhaber uh, is actually from the Chicago area, and he is the CEO of 26 Characters, a marketing collective, but previously uh, he was in charge for marketing, digital marketing, for two Fortune 500 companies, uh, JLL and Aon, uh, where he was responsible for web, social, mobile search, and content marketing. But prior to that, he also spent nine years at Digitas, which is a global marketing and technology agency. And he is also the author of What's Your Problem? A marketing book about problem solving. Steve, thanks for being part of the show. Yeah, thanks for having me. Great to be here. Well, and if you could, uh, you know, give us a little bit of insight into some of the work that you're right that you're doing right now um, at 26 Characters, so we can get a better understanding of you know where your your thinking and where your mindset and where your passion is. Yeah, so uh, a lot of the work that I'm doing right now for 26 Characters has to do with professional service companies in the B2B space. And we're essentially using content to solve a problem for them. Now that could be on the early side of the funnel. Let's say they're doing prospecting or same thing as if they've already got the client and they have to deliver an experience, uh, you know, deliver a great experience. So to me, we're sometimes, um, we're writing blog posts. Sometimes uh, we're creating email sequences. Sometimes, you know, it may be a presentation uh, capabilities deck. So it's really, we're focused on how do you use content at all these different moments in time to ultimately create a, you know, what I like to call a frictionless experience so that your customer never feels like you're overwhelming them with information or they feel completely out of the blue because they don't know what you're up to. So that's, that's what we're passionate about at 26 Characters. And, uh, you know, we use the term content very loosely. Content can be very, very short social media updates. Uh, It it could be long form, right? Like we've also done buying guides where you may have someone and you can, you can capture 10, 15 minutes of their, of their day, just digesting the content. So that's kind of in a nutshell what we've been up to. Well, as you're talking, I start also thinking about a lot of companies that have essentially a a blended or a hybrid uh, solution to where they may have a particular product, you know, a, uh, as well as a prof- professional services group. And so they have kind of really looked at their revenue generation a little bit differently. So I have certain percentage being from my products and then a certain percentage being from my pro services. Yep. So are you running into that uh, quite often or do you see value in having that model and some of the work that you're doing for those that have solutions? Yeah, so I would say the most of the businesses that we focus on, they're pure play service models. So these are these are people who I kind of describe as they're selling invisible products. So we have to take the invisible, make them real. Uh, I work with a lot of executive recruiters who, you know, there is, there's no product there, right? It's a person, it's their experiences, it's the stories that they tell. So that's the, that's the focus for us. We, rear, we rarely get into uh, the hybrid models that you're speaking of. Well, but when I start thinking about that, there's still, um, I, I can still see some benefit and value. Because here, when you start talking about innovation and getting creative, uh, you definitely can't stay in your own lane. I mean, you have to venture out a little bit. You have to take a walk. You have to go around yeah. perspectives and all that. And so when I start thinking about that for you, really, what is your core passion in the work that you're doing right now? I mean, the core, the core passion, I would say, really gets into, um, you know, I think you've got to separate the business and the challenge that the business faces and then marketing as its own thing. I think, you know, I've been a marketing person forever. Um, And the more time I've spent in marketing, I've realized that the real value in what I do is understanding the business and the business problem that I'm trying to solve. I think that, you know, today there is literally just too many things at the fingertips of marketers. Uh, If you look at the MarTech stacks, 
it's enormous, it's hard to understand. Um, the most value I could ever provide to uh, one of my clients is to really get into their business and understand what the problem is. And then once I feel like I'm in that rich area, I then can start thinking whether that's strategically or tactically from a marketing perspective to solve those problems. And I think in doing that, that really kind of gets myself and my team out of that let's just do cool stuff to do cool stuff because there's a new technology that creates something, you know, faster, or easier, or more interesting. If, if you don't have that attached to what you're actually trying to solve for, then to me, it's, it's not as fun. Um, you know, when you, when, as a marketer, when you can deliver business value, that's when, you know, marketing isn't just seen as an extra fluffy, nice to have. It's a, wow, marketing gets the business. They can solve problems, you know, whether that might be, lead generation, uh, lead conversion, increasing net promoter score, you know, any of those business metrics, those are the juicy things that I always like to attach myself to. Okay. So, you know, you bring up a really interesting point because the, the actual tech stack is, you know, forever growing. But when I start thinking about a lot of these things, they're, they're quite overrated because it's the fundamentals that we have to continue to do. So what would you say right now that you see is kind of overrated when it comes to B2B digital marketing? Well, I mean, I, I, I think the big thing is, is think about, you know, what are the four or five, maybe six things from a, from a MarTech ecosystem that you really need, right? And it usually gets down to how are we going to find these people? How do we capture the information? How do we manage them with the CRM? And then what are some, maybe some channel management activities? I think that the, the exciting part of the MarTech world exploding over the past, you know, five, 10 years is that there's so many interesting things that are happening some of them go on to become great companies. Others fizzle out after a year or two after, you know, VC or, or PE funding goes away. Um, but I think that's the thing is, is you just got to keep it simple. I always like to know kind of what's, what's happening uh, on that, in that world, but I'm very quick to, to step back and say, that might be interesting to my business or to my client's business, but I'm just going to watch that for now. Like, unless I, unless I really see the incremental value, then, um, you know, I, I've learned as a marketer over the years is to be excited, but also be cautious. Well, that's true. And so when you are reviewing things, though, and, you know, you start potentially pursuing a path, you know, certain things you'll say, okay, well, this could cause us to differentiate. This is, this could cause, you know, a little bit of disruption. Is there something out there that you kind of are getting a, you know, a feeling about could be, you know, a disruptor? You know, I kind of get more, I'm not a, um, as much as I enjoy the tech stack side of it, um, I really think that the richness of being a good marketer gets down to the strategies and the, and the thinking of what you're doing with it. So for example, um, finding, the, finding your audience, assuming that you really know who your customer is, uh, you know, there's hundreds of platforms to, to purchase data or advertise on those platforms. And to me, I've almost found more success in my own business when I said, I just want to organically understand who those people are. So if I'm going after 15 clients, it's not hard to find out who these clients are, what their names are, what their levels are, what their email addresses are. Um, so I don't, I don't need a new shiny bell and whistle to kind of do that. I can, I can create my own campaign by just saying, here are my, here are my top 10, 15 dream clients. Um, you know, I can take an account-based marketing approach to say, all right, here's client one. Here's the most senior person I, I might have a relationship with to here's the, you know, the actual decision maker and just work it that way. And I think that, um, you know, the whole growth hacking mindset, I've always been a student of that because it's just very simply like you can do a lot of these things on your own without too much investment on, uh, of big platforms. I think if you can create those wins organically using not a big marketing stack, um, then, okay, great. You've proven success. Now go big. If you want to scale it, then, then use the, the tech stack that is out there to, to create that more of a, of a larger machine. But I always like to start really small and much of a, you know, it's almost like an experimentation lab environment where I try to prove it. And then if I'm doing something really well, then you can build a funnel, then you can just put people into that funnel, watch it, measure it, tweak it. Um, so yeah, that's how, that's how I look at kind of when to, when to engage in, in certain technology versus do it 
do it very much with my own hands. Well, I think, you know, you bring up the thing that for all of us is kind of like that um, catch 22 in some points where it's like, okay, I know I need to test, but I also need to get results. <laughs> yeah. How do you actually balance that? Well, I mean, I think that the idea of a proof of concept um, is a really powerful thing to have and, and not getting obsessed with getting everything 100% right. I mean, it's, it's why all the Silicon Valley firms were able to quickly rise up out of nowhere, right? It's because they knew how to test it, create it in a very lean environment. Um, you know, I've worked for small companies. I've worked for huge companies. Um, it's the smaller companies, or at least the smaller, some big companies are, are able to create a small company environment if they have really small divisions and they let them have autonomy. But once you get to that mindset of let's be very nimble, let's fail fast, um, you know, you could, you could see some results in a month or two um, where if you, if you embrace too much of it and you have too many people involved in decision making, you know, you may spend a year or two trying to get a project off the ground. Um, and that can be frustrating for both the, you know, the marketers involved in that process as well as the business who, who is trying to figure out why is this taking a year or two for, for this program to show actual impact. Well, and with that, you know, you start talking about, um, you know, budget constraints. I think everybody has to deal with those. So if you were to say that I, you know, wanted to do some allocation, I wanted to actually move, remove some, you know, budget from this particular activity that we're doing or this part of our strategy that we're doing, what would you move it to? Yeah, that's a good question. I think that first thing I would do is, is think about what's the business problem that I'm trying to solve for, right? Like I go back to the overused funnel, but it's important, right? Like, is this an awareness thing? Is this a consideration thing? Um, you also have to look at how you're engaging with your customers. Do you have a direct model, you know, where you're selling from the company direct to consumer uh, or are you going through a distribution system via a sales force? So I think for me, if I looked at budget allocation, um, I'm, a, I'm a huge fan of content. Like I've, I've been in the content world for a while and I think there's something to be said for, you know, someone who worked in an ad agency a while back where we always thought of ideas and concepts and media buys as a way to kind of create that marketplace change. I'm much more passionate now about creating genuine content that helps the customer or your prospect um, and to build a relationship that way, right? So the old model to me was do something clever and interesting to get people's attention. Now deliver true content to help them, right? And as you're delivering that content, that's the same thing as building a relationship. So it was built through awareness and TV in the old days. Now you can build it through content. Um, and if, if you are patient with it, you can say, look, we want to have a customer who doesn't know us today. And over the course of two to three months, we are going to figure out ways to reach them, whether that's organically, um, whether that's through targeted advertising, you, you could do it on a small scale as well. So I think that to me is what I'd really focus on is that getting that money to spend on really high quality content and then also enough of that money to, to also figure out how to distribute it. You know, maybe, maybe direct mail is a channel that works. If you've got a, a really um, refined target, uh, you know, I've tested some direct mail in the last year or two and have had a lot of success with it just because who's doing direct mail now? No one. Uh, and if you can drop a direct mail piece on someone's desk, you know, and, it, and it's there from Monday, it sits there for a day, they open it, even if they pitch it, right? Like you've interrupted their pattern of, you know, they didn't delete your email or they didn't ignore your banner ad. Um, so yeah, I, I would really focus to me on content. So it's what's old may be new again, right? Um, you have to test. I think that goes back to what you were talking about a moment ago. Yep. But then the other side of the constraints piece is there are no constraints. You know, so if you had a, you know, unlimited budget and you can do whatever you wanted to do, you know, where do you think you would be putting it on? Would it be just to generate more content or what? What would it be? Yeah, well, I mean, I think I'm, I'll answer this question assuming that you know a lot about your customer, right? So let's say that you've talked to customers, you've done research and you say, here are my five big issues that my customers are, are facing. To me, I still look at, it as, look at it as how can we use content to solve that problem? Um, you know, Hootsuite, or I should say HubSpot is a great example of a company that really embraced content marketing. 
Um, for example, they knew that agencies played a role in influencing a client making a decision on what platform to use. So um, what they started doing was creating content that purely was going to help agencies. So they had, you know, how to give better feedback to creative people, how to do a creative person's performance review. There was nothing to do with their software. It purely was, we know that we want to create all this goodwill towards agencies and that's all we're going to do. We're not even going to, we're not even going to have them do a trial. Um, we just want them to say, who is, who's this company? Uh, who's HubSpot? What are they all about? And that's how they were kind of using content as their way to get into the influencer. So, um, I, you know, I, I'd focus on the content. I think my dream team of content people, I think that if you can find a writer, a designer, someone who really gets, um, you know, video, maybe photography, sometimes you can get folks who kind of know both of those worlds. Um, maybe get a, a person to know the channel and the management. So like understanding the analytics behind how all that content is consumed. I think that you could build a really good four to six person team to really create that content to help solve those problems. And that's, you know, if you can genuinely create amazing content, that's when the other stuff, whether that's like referrals and engagement and sharing, that becomes easier because you just know that it's, that the, the content is helpful and that's how people are, uh, you know, that's how you're proving to them that you know how to add value. Well, I think one of the biggest things that many organizations struggle with is the whole content generation piece, right? It's, um, and then for me, what I also see is, uh, is on the backside of that is, you know, the repurposing element of it. Um, and so they, they struggle with that a lot. So, you know, when you start talking about the MarTech stack, when you start talking about, you know, knowing your, your customer better, I mean, there's a lot of factors uh, that lead to success. Um, so how, what, what is one particular question that a, a digital marketer needs to be uh, asking themselves? What's that one important question? The, so the, just to clarify, the question as it relates to how they should go about the, the act of creating content? Or just uh, in looking at everything. Like I have all these factors, I got all these technologies, I have all of this, you know, sitting in front of me. You yeah. know, really the one important question that we need to be asking ourselves. Yeah, I mean, I'd, I'd say, you know, I'm, I'm a big customer-centric person. So I, I would basically frame it into something along the lines of is our customer viewing our marketing uh, as favorable? Are they, are they being moved forward? Are we helping them in how they make decisions? Are we helping to make their life easier? I think that, you know, it's easy for a bunch of marketers or even salespeople to sit around and evaluate marketing um, to say, is it working or not? Uh, it's a difficult conversation to have. And I felt like if you can add a customer to that conversation and just ask the customer, hey, what we're sending you, how we're engaging, is this a good thing? Is it helping you? What's broken? How would you fix it? And I think that if you can ask your customer that question, um, two things are going to happen. One, obviously your customers are, are going to get better content, better experiences. And two, you've made the conversation at the internal part of the company a little bit easier because it's not a it's not a debating of who thinks something is working better or not it really is well let's just listen to the customer as long as we we have that customer in front of us guiding us then that's when that alignment can happen between sales marketing product business uh it just it just makes it all way more easy okay so you spent all of last year, and I'm, of course you were working too, but <laughs> you spent last year writing your book, you know, yeah. your problem. So give us some insight into uh, the, the book, why you wrote the book, and what it could provide as value uh, to a B2B digital marketer. Yeah, so yeah, it took just over a year to write the book. And here's the reason I wrote it is, um, you know, for about 10, 15 years, I was the digital guy that everyone brought into the room to say, we need something, Steve. We, we might need a new website. We need an app. We need this. We need that. Uh, and I love that people were so excited about wanting to get into the digital channel. I love that channel. Um, but there was one question that I kept on asking over and over again because so many of these conversations would just, would just, you'd spend two hours talking to someone and you were like, I don't even know where we are, right? So the question I would always ask them is, what's your business problem? 
Why are we having this conversation? And, and, and two things would always happen once I asked that question. One, uh, you've got half the people who said, I, I don't really know. I don't know the business problem I'm trying to solve. And that was a, that was a good litmus test for both of us uh, to say, well, let's focus on the business problem because I'm not, I don't want to do this just to do it. Um, the other folks said, well, here's the problem I'm trying to solve. And as soon as that problem was articulated, uh, then I could figure out as a marketer how to, how to strategically or tactically go in and help them. And I think I realized looking back that um, problem solving is a skill that really not everyone is taught, um, even going back into the educational system. So I said, I'm going to write a book about problem solving, why it's important. Um, so the first half of my book is, is all about different ways to solve problems, things that get in our way, in our minds when we try to solve them. Um, and I kind of break it down into, you know, there's probably six or seven fundamental business problems that people have. And then after that, the second half of the book gets into, well, now that this is your problem, here's how you can use content marketing within a B2B environment to solve it. Um, so, you know, it really kind of, um, there, there's one takeaway from the book. I mean, you don't have to buy the book and then you just have to basically say, what's your problem? What are you, what are you trying to solve? And if you hammer that over and over again, whether that's to yourself or other people you're working with, that will provide so much clarity. Uh, it, it, it works every time. Okay. But you, I mean, it's not that simple. I mean, you know, spend a year and a half writing a book and, and culminating the years of experience that you have into a book uh, that's that rolled up in that simple. So typically, you know, what I've seen, you know, working with a lot of other authors is they have those frameworks that you were talking about. You talked about those seven issues and then you talked about the whole matching process and doing all of that. So I would dare to say this whole planning and the canvas, you know, and, and uh, cheats, you know, checklists and guides and all of those things that you have are a critical element of all this problem solving. Yeah, sure. I think I look at those as those are little tactics, right? So there's a hundred tactics available to you as a marketer. Um, that's when you get into the, should we do an infographic versus a checklist versus a blog post versus an email? Like it, it's, a, it's an ongoing list of tactics. And I think that when you start with that business problem and you start with that lens of what is the customer need, um, you know, you, you don't jump to the tactics. I think the people who jump into tactics first, they have a lot of fun, but then there's also a lot of spin, right? Because you, is this the best tactic? We like it. Like, hey, who doesn't want to create an infographic or a video? But um, you're, you know, some audiences hate videos. Other audiences love videos, right? So if, if you don't understand um, how your audience consumes that content and what you're trying to solve for, then t the, the tactics can be misguided. So I, I think that as a marketer over the years, you certainly have experiencing, uh, have experience with all these different tactics. What, you know, the pros, the cons, uh, there's certainly time constraints, budget constraints to some degree when you're creating those different things. But um, yeah, I don't know if I, I don't, I don't know if I answered your question, but I, I think it's that it, you've kind of, over the years, I've forced myself to separate tactics and, and problems uh, because it's just uh, as much as you want to get in there and solve it with a tactic, you got to really dissect it and figure out what you're really trying to solve for. Well, I think it's important to note, though, because, I mean, for many of us, we get demands put on us. Hey, I want an infographic, right? And so they, they come to you and say, I want these things. And then so what we have to be able to do is go back to what you're talking about and say, you know, well, what problem are you trying to solve? And then, you know, you have to kind of reverse it at that point to say, okay, well, then based on all of that, here's the path that I would recommend us going. And those yeah, are important skills to have. Yeah, absolutely. I, I think reverse engineering is a, re I like that term a lot because it really gets into, um, you know, a lot of conversations start with marketers being told what they need, right? Um, and I kind of, as I've managed teams over the years, um, there, there's this story I tell about, you know, you've got to, you have to ask yourself, are you the type of marketer that is the pharmacist or are you the marketer who is the doctor, right? So the pharmacist just gets a prescription and fills it. Um, and they may give you some, you know, here are some warnings about this medication. Don't do this, do this. Um, the great doctors out there can really listen to what's happening to a patient. 
look at data, ask really thoughtful questions, and then diagnose, right? And that, I think that's what you've got to do as a great marketer is you have to diagnose before you prescribe. Okay, talking about that uh, and looking at those seven core problems that you find, you know, what is one thing that you see people doing often or having to do often or being told to do often that probably isn't a good thing to be doing? I mean, I certainly think that whatever the sexy thing that's happening, right, as far as like whether it's technology or it could even be like a, a creative execution of something, they certainly kind of have these one to two year cycles where it, something cool is happening in this channel. Um, it's providing a different type of experience. It's new. It's different. We like it, right? So the people in the channel like it because it's fresh and new, but it may not even be a good fit with your customer. So I, I think as I see these new bells and whistles come up, you really have to kind of say, is our, what's our customer's reaction to this, right? Like you have to separate yourself as a marketer into what does your customer think? Things that you may feel are really old and outdated as a marketer because you've been doing them for 15 years, your customer may love them, right? Like I, I've seen people kind of want to reinvent marketing and their customers are like, what are, you, what are you doing? Like you're taking away the good stuff. So I think that it's uh, making sure that marketers who spend hours and years playing with these different channels um, know that your customer is not as savvy as you. Your, your customer does not know the 15 different ways to create animation and storytelling and all that stuff. So I think really um, avoid the bells and whistles. Every now and then you're going to find something that actually is both cool and relevant to your customer. So that's the intersection that you really want to focus on. So I'm not, I'm not trying to be the old curmudgeon that says like, ah, all these new things, all these kids, right? Like, that's not what I'm saying. It's about having that wisdom to say, this is something new and there is a really cool application that our customer also will find some value in. So Steve, we'll definitely put a, a link to what's your problem on your show notes page as well. But if you could, please tell the B2B DM how, gang how they can get in touch with you. Yeah, I appreciate it. Yeah, go to my website, 26characters.com. Uh, just a, a pretty straightforward overview of services. We've also got a lot of blog posts for folks who are in, you know, I would say heads of content marketing where we, we help them figure out how to plan some of the early portions of their content marketing uh, strategy out. If they're getting into annual planning, we have some advice on there. Uh, you can hit me up on LinkedIn. And if you want to send me an email, I'm at steve at 26characters.com. That's the number 26characters.com. Steve Goldhaber, thanks for sharing your knowledge and wisdom, and we wish you the very best. All right. Thanks for having me. I appreciate it. Thank you for joining us. Go now to join the B2B DM gang in the B2B Marketer LinkedIn group, where you can connect with other B2B DM disruptors and get access to our B2B DM cheat sheets, checklist, and guides. While you're at it, if you found value in this show, please help by going to iTunes to rate, review, and subscribe. And share the show on all of your digital platforms. Be sure to tune in next week for our next episode. And always remember, you can automate your lead capture, but you must lure your lead.